Welcome to Data Leadership for Everyone. I'm your host, Anthony Algman. Everyone needs to harness the power of data. There's a lot involved in making that happen, and this show is here to make it all a little bit easier. Think of this as an audio advice column for all your data and leadership questions. Our guest today is Brennan Lamy. Brennan started a landscaping company in Idaho when he was 16 years old and grew it to 15 employees before going to college. In 2021, still at a young age, he left college to found Quill, a decentralized database solution serving as the foundation for a new sector of highly complex data-intensive dApps and protocols. Lamy is eager to help developers who are currently required to build on clunky, unscalable blockchain-based data architecture. He's simplifying the development process while providing an extremely low-cost and scalable solution for storing and querying large amounts of data in a protocolized way. Brennan, welcome to Data Leadership for Everyone. Hey, Anthony. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Really a pleasure to be here. Yeah, we're excited to have you. And, And so I just read your bio, and I would ask you to translate the bio into words normal humans can understand, because we've got D apps and protocols. And I'll tell you, I I was very proud of myself for not botching the bio. I almost always botch the bio and have to stitch it back together. I didn't do that, but I will tell you that protocolized word I had literally never seen before in my life. And I'm like, it just came out. I'm like, okay, that's good. So anyway, we're, we're, we're excited to have you, but what it is, what, or what is it that Quill does and, and what's your, um, why did you feel compelled to leave college to, to create this company? I'm so curious about this. Yeah. So I mean, Quill, we were building a decentralized data platform, um, specifically relational databases. And I, I'm sure we'll dive a bit uh, later into what exactly that uh, means. Um, But the reason that I left uh, college to build it, um, I guess actually the reason I got into building it in the first place, why I left college, um, and this also gets to why it's important, uh, it comes down to being able to guarantee uh, users' rights on the internet. Um, Mm -hmm. There's this concept that I think a lot of your listeners would probably be familiar with. It's called uh, platform risk. So, uh, you know, when you use a platform, you're essentially uh, like you are... um, you are conceding to the rules of their game. You say, you know, you can, you can do, you know, not, you know, necessarily whatever you want, but you are, uh, you know, the platform has a lot of control over uh, their users and who is built on top of that. And the really cool thing about decentralized technologies is that it sort of removes that, uh, it removes that uh, friction in the relationship. So when you're building on decentralized, and I think the key word is probably permissionless technologies, mm. uh, there is not a risk to the user that the platform can go and change the rules, uh, you know, later in the future. Uh, when everyone comes and uses that platform, they know the rules of the game, they know how it can be used. And uh, in the case of data, we find this to be very important when uh, companies, when their users need a guarantee against platform risk um, and they need those, uh, yeah, they essentially need to hedge against those guarantees. So I'm not sure if that makes sense, trying to keep it like at a high level uh, Mm -hmm. on that one, but happy to dive deeper on those. Let me make sure I'm understanding platform risk uh, to begin with. So is is platform risk, what I would infer to be is, is this platform could go away or the company could go away or that something isn't supported or or what exactly is that platform risk? Yeah. So I think uh, a really great example is uh, if you took, so right now there's a big push in web three to do, um, do you know what under collateralized lending is? You familiar with under collateralized lending? I, I do, but I doubt the audience does. So So essentially, you know, when you want to go and get a loan, uh, you need to put up some uh, collateralization for that loan. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the keys that Web3 has brought is that you can do that uh, permissionlessly. Uh, You don't need banking infrastructure. There doesn't need to be a company. There's actually a protocol that runs entirely on its own that will do that for you. Um, But that's all over collateralized. Um, Mm -hmm. And so uh, for under collateralization, you do need to be able to identify who wants to take out that loan. Um, Because if it's under collateralized, they can just walk away with it. And so it's really important that you can say, oh, this is Anthony. Um, I know who this is. This is who I'm giving the loan. Um, But at the same time, you don't need a company that's bearing that risk. You can have mathematical models that bear that risk. Mm. Uh, But in order to to build this where you don't need a company, that means that you cannot have platform risk. So if all of this data that is identifying you as Anthony, uh, if Mm -hmm. that is living on a central platform, uh, and that platform, they decide to change either how the platform works and there's breaking changes with that, or if they decide that they don't want to serve this data anymore or they go out of business, mm-hmm. well, then all of a sudden, uh, the, the lending platform, it cannot do its job. And you know, the key here is that that lending platform, it is not a company. It is, mm-hmm. it is a self-sustaining platform. Um, and so 
it's pretty necessary to uh, not have platform risk when you are building technologies like this. And so in the case of Quill, you can build this lending platform where uh, you, I can identify you as Anthony. We can have mm -hmm. uh, this complex data architecture, but also you know that this is not a liability for you. You know that even even if I you know, I walk away, never write a line of code again in my life, and everybody who's working mm -hmm. on Quill does not you know continue to work on Quill. Uh, the the your your lending platform that is built on top of Quill will continue running as it was previously, um, and that's really key for a lot of the new businesses that are starting to come up really in the last three or four years. So there's two avenues of thought here. The first is just a comment that we can circle back to if you have anything to add to it. But then the, the second is where I think there's a real interesting question. The first is that this makes a lot of sense to me now that you've explained it that way, because I one of the things that I, I, I've had conversations and different guests on this podcast and another podcast around like low code, no code solutions, but a lot of those seem to be the opposite effect of locking people into a platform that is highly specialized and you have to have like a secret decoder ring just to make the low code platform work at all. And so that I don't know that that's the right path as far as my mindset goes. But then when you say like, I like this because in my mind, everything that you explained about kind of that that elimination of platform risk to me, that's just like, okay, now we have an algorithm or we have some code that regardless of whether or not the people who wrote that code are still around, that code just works and that, that it does exactly what it's supposed to do. And it, that doesn't change. The thing that I immediately jumped to though, is that, well, then you're living in a state where you don't have necessarily that shepherding that an organization or a platform would typically provide. And, you don't have what we would in the data space have like the equivalent of data stewards or whatever. Like what happens if Anthony has bad data that has infiltrated this and yet no one is responsible for this lending platform because it just kind of exists now. What happens if Anthony has a bad credit rating that he doesn't deserve or something like that? Like that, how do you fix that then? Is there, is there a way to fix that or is that just the byproduct of something like this? Yeah. So uh, it, it's not like an absolute byproduct. I think um, in the example I gave, you know, we can sort of think of it as a spectrum, right? Uh, from mm -hmm. something that is managed by a company to something that is totally self-sustaining. And I think like uh, an example of the, the totally decentralized self-sustaining is, you know, Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. Now, this is not uh, financial necessarily, or like Quill is not financial necessarily. Um, but those are, it's not black and white. It really is a spectrum. And so most mm -hmm. of the cases we actually see Quill used in, um, it's not like it's being used in this totally self-sustaining platform, but how it is being used is that there is a company that maybe they need to do something like I just described with uh, uh, lending data. Mm -hmm. um, but there are actually five or 10 different companies that are responsible for upkeeping that. Uh, and in many cases, these companies are actually competitors. But the reason why they're able to use this shared data store on the same platform is because the rules of the game, you know, the rules for how data can enter the system, what data lives in the system, the schema for the data, how it can be, how you can retrieve that, it is defined ahead of time. And there are cryptographic proofs that are done to ensure that that is maintained throughout hmm. and throughout the, uh, you know, I, ideally uh, unending li lifetime of this application. Um, and so in most real use cases, we do actually see that there are companies that are maintaining this data. But the key is that you can have several companies and those can change over time. And no matter you know, if you are switching all the companies that are responsible for running this platform, it will continue running as it was uh, as as it was defined. It does make sense that if you've created specific rules around how data can come in and come out, along with the business logic associated with that that platform, whatever that ecosystem has become, then theoretically it should just naturally go. It reminds me of there's a, a scientific experiment, and I'm gonna I'm gonna mess up all the details, but they they basically tried to create a ecosystem inside of this big glass jar and there's like some anniversary or something that's happening, but they, they basically put in the right things, put in a little water and then realized later, like 10 years later, they need a little bit more water, put in a little bit more water and started in like in the sixties, added a little more water in the seventies and then they've locked it up ever since. And the whole thing has continued to survive and grow and everything in this kind of truly walled garden because there's no other interaction. It's, it's sealed. And it's that kind of thing where you could create enough balance and enough controls around it that this would continue to last indefinitely because it is cut off. And it, that's what makes it powerful is that it can just keep going. Is that is that a fair analogy, even though poorly explained? <laughs> no, I, I, I think it's well ex, uh, explained. And yes, I think that is the end goal. So, I mean, what we see with a lot of projects do this, and I think you know, Bitcoin is a phenomenal example, or uh, I mean, Ethereum is another one. 
um, where it does start with a company, right? I mean, Quill, we are a, we're a six person team right now building this product and a lot of people building on top of us, you know, they're also, most of them are larger than us, but, uh, they are, you know, they, they are real companies. They, they have, they have a company, um, and they're developing this product. Um, but over time that ecosystem does become a bit more self-sustaining and I want to be careful to not try to suggest that there are such things as perpetual motion machines. Um, you know, those, those cannot exist. Um, right. But yes, the idea is that over time, you know, just like in the example you gave, uh, those scientists, they had to begin by getting the jar and putting things in the jar and building that ecosystem. And they had to plan mm. what went in that jar. Um, and they probably had to cultivate it or maybe they didn't. I'm, I'm not too sure on the specific example, but they probably had to do some things to make sure that jar did not die. But over time, it hopefully became sustainable enough to where they did not have to have direct intervention. And that's really the goal of people building platforms like ours and building on platforms like ours. It's a good point. And, and, and I think about your perpetual motion example, because that's not so I hadn't really considered that. But there is one thing that enters that ecosystem, and that's energy. It's light. So light does come in and impact that. They haven't touched the things that were inside. It's sort of created its own self-balance. But you can definitely bet that there is light coming into that from the outside. And that is providing that energy, again, to create ongoing life without it being that perpetual motion machine. So good call because that, that sunlight, that is that continued, uh, renewing energy. So, um, that's, that's really cool. I have to ask, there has to be an origin story here. How in the world does it, cause I know what I was doing in college and it wasn't coming up with new database and, uh, economic driving functions or whatever. I think a lot about that stuff. Now I was not thinking a lot about that in the past and anyone who knew me in college will vouch for me on that statement. But the, the question is what in the world compelled you to think of this and start a company around this? Yeah. So it didn't actually start with the database. So, uh, I think I was actually, I was the first user of Quill, the database. Um, mm -hmm. I was also the creator, but um, yeah, I was the first user because I was trying to build a permissionless uh, communication platform. So mm -hmm. kind of this self-sustaining ecosystem, but for people to publish and uh, consume, consume data. Sort of uh, like a mix of like a Twitter slash like a Telegram. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was, I, most of the time was actually spent on the, like the hard technicals of it. And that's why we ended up with Quill, the database and not Quill, like the messaging platform. Uh, but I wanted to build this platform because, I mean, for one, I'm very passionate about users' rights on the internet. Um, just like how we have public spaces when we you know, go outside and go to the park, walk down the street, um, and we have rights in those spaces, uh, we should have that on the internet, and we do not. Um, and I think growing up in the age of the internet, uh, you know, people in my generation, and I mean, this is very applicable to me specifically, a lot of my life has been spent on the internet. And so for me to be able to see, wow, we don't have rights in these spaces. We don't have, uh, we don't have guarantees, you know, on these places where we're spending a large amount of our time, that is really concerning. Uh, and so that is really what prompted me to start with the communication platform, but that did ultimately lead to the database. I like that. And, and, and you're absolutely right. And you're bringing a, um, both a unique perspective as a obviously technology sophisticated uh, individual, but having grown up in this world of, of internet, which, you know, you're definitely a younger generation than myself, but it's, I can certainly appreciate the fact that you're seeing this need. And first and foremost, like most great businesses, you are first solving a problem that you identified that you have. And that that creates a pull to help solve that for others who share that, whether or not they've been able to identify it the, the same way that you have. So I applaud you for recognizing that, doing that and having the courage to go out and build a company around that at a young age. I mean, I think this is a, a pretty commendable uh, initiative, and it's certainly something that the technical details of which will uh overcome most people in terms of understanding, probably myself included, um, in, in terms of understanding all of the intricacies of making it happen. But I think the outputs of it and and the the things that you can create with it, like a public space within the internet that can live somewhat independently without constant nurturing. I think somebody, I can only imagine somebody growing up in your generation, you know, you've been the product for most of your life. When you're working on the internet, you're doing things on the internet, companies like Facebook, I'll just throw out there as an example, not to put words in your mouth, but somebody like Facebook, like we, we are, it's our data that is the thing that creates value there. And we are that life force, that energy that is providing the sustaining force for something like Facebook. 
we're not getting the compensation that we deserve for doing that under most circumstances. So can you create a fairer way to do that? That is a very compelling hypothesis as far as I'm concerned. I also think, too, that just because you've been somebody, and this is true for all of us now, just because we we use data constantly doesn't mean we know how to nurture data or create the ecosystem. We can participate in the ecosystem without knowing how to build the ecosystem. That takes another level of commitment and talent and effort. But I think that that's something that I've seen, and I'm curious your take on this. Um, something that I've seen in the broader just data space is that we're all familiar with data. We all understand that data is valuable, but we haven't necessarily built the right techniques or established the right tools or the right mentalities of taking that valuable raw material and turning it into something that creates real value and that we're protecting the right ways or that we're using the right ways or that we are managing our own personal data in a way that's responsible. Have would you agree with that statement or, or have you, do you perceive it differently coming from a, a, a bit of a different generation? Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting. I do think that, um, our generator, uh, m my generation, I'm, I'm Gen Z. Uh, I, I think we might have a different, uh, maybe a different relationship because we've had to grow up, you know, growing up since, I mean, before I can remember, my mom was always said, you know, be careful what you put on the internet. You know, don't put mm -hmm. something on the internet that you would not want to uh, exist publicly. Um, and I don't know if other generations necessarily, um, you know, grew up with that being ingrained with them. You know, just like how you look both ways when you cross the street, uh, you should really check twice before you put something on the internet. Um, mm -hmm. And that was something that I grew up with just as like a, a life rule, but I don't know if that's uh, necessarily applicable to, to everybody. Um, but I do think, uh, you know, in, in general, uh, mo it seems that most of the abuses of consumer trust on the internet have been data related. And maybe that's because data isn't everything we do. And so that might be kind of a, you know, might be a pretty generally applicable statement. But if you look at the Cambridge Analytica scandal, you know, you brought up Facebook. Uh, right, that, yeah. was the, that was the uh, process of them selling data to another company, you know, selling other people's private data without them knowing. Um, and so I think... Uh, I, I think you really hit the nail on the head there with, uh, you know, what we are doing and why we are trying to do it. Um, yeah, it really is about, uh, you know, building more, I don't want to say trust. I think removing the need for trust on the internet. Uh, you can use the internet, you can put your data on there, you can use these platforms and you don't need to trust those platforms. Uh, it's cryptographically guaranteed to you that they will play by the rules of the game and they cannot abuse your trust. It, it I, I kind of like this idea of a, of a post-trust internet where you can lock in the things that you want to lock in. But I'm also thinking like everything's a lie <laughs> and that we are quickly getting to a point where with AI and, and deep fakes and things like that, everything is a lie. So it's almost like we're coming full circle from what you what you would put on the internet, you've got to watch out for, to now literally anything could be on the internet, fake or not, because it can all just be created. And so then how do you create a world of trust where everything is a lie? And so that's, it's an interesting thought, because if we want to get back to what you were originally talking about with, you know, Anthony as a, um, you know, as a, as a borrower of something, if everything out there can be a lie, how can we verify anything? And so that is a new it's, it's a new twist on the on the same subject. But I think it becomes a very important one, because if we don't have a way to trust anything when data is concerned, we will lose all of that potential value of that data and that we can't do that either. And so I think this is a whole new evolution and a whole new um, uh change to how we as people interact with the internet. I also think about like the the whole chat GPT has been very popular in the last, you know, six months a year. And that's fascinating to me. I had an AI specialist on a couple of different ones, actually. And one of the things that they talked about, because like these assertion engines like chat GPT, yes, you have a natural language to it, but then you are seeing today's output is like, it asserts everything with no promise of what's true or not it just makes it all look true but if you get a bio i'm sure we could get chat gpt to write your bio and half of it would be completely wrong it would all sound great but half of it would just be total nonsense but it doesn't know what half is true or what's not and this whole problem of provenance and data quality in an ai engine is way more difficult to solve than to get some natural language processing AI bot to shoot out a bunch of garbage. Like that's, it's, it's a whole different world. And that's what it sounds to me like you're trying to promote is a world in which we can 
bring in the verify and trust, but verify. And it really is like, don't trust, but verify because we, we need those safe spaces. We need that public square where you can go and do those things, but there's freedom and there's protections and there are um, the right kind of controls. I think, yeah, this is a really, this is a really interesting concept. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that uh, you definitely get to the crux of what a lot of people in, I, w- I would see the broader, I think Web3 is like a, a, a bad term, but in the broader mm-hmm. space of people that are building decentralized technologies, that is really one of the big problem areas we're trying to solve. You know, how do you, how do you guarantee provenance on the internet? I um, mean, you know, provenance requires time and uh, you know, I won't get too deep into this, but time is one of the hardest things about distributed systems is guaranteeing time mm-hmm. across all those systems. So on the internet, how can you guarantee provenance of something uh, to tell whether or not it was generated by somebody um, at a certain point in time? And that is actually something that decentralized technologies like Quill and others can solve. Um, but then there's also the question of uh, who actually created something, uh, essentially provenance, but not the when, but the who. Um, mm-hmm. So, And that is the other thing that actually has already been solved uh, for a couple other reasons, but it's still mostly only like really seriously being used in uh, like decentralized and permissionless applications. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a, uh, in, so uh, I, I don't want to go too deep into uh, like uh, asymmetric uh, cryptography, but uh, in decentralized platforms, there are ways of guaranteeing who is interacting with the platform. And that's why when you use something like Bitcoin, your money is secure and only you mm. can spend that money. Um, but that is generally applicable to any platform that is built on decentralized technology. So if you are building a Twitter or a blogging application, uh, because of the necessary uh, security guarantees that already need to be provided, um, it actually gives us a lot of other guarantees when you get to the issue of AI generated content and AI generating a bio for me that is totally incorrect or uh, something like that. And so decentralized platforms, they do absolutely solve the problems that you're bringing up. And that's why so many people are very passionate about them. That is, that's really interesting. And so in the last couple of minutes that we have, I want to ask you, um, uh, t- take it in a little bit of a different direction and, and understand from the, the entrepreneur hat, like the business model for Quill, how do you take what is, I think, pretty clearly from our existing conversation, a, um, a valuable thing? How do you take that which is very technical, has a limited um, ability for common folk to understand all the intricacies of. How do you turn that into a business? How do you how do you sell? How do you go to market with this? And who are you looking to do business with? Is this a technology that another organization implements? Is this a service offering, or, or how does it actually work? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and so uh, the kind of the short answer on this is that. The jury is still somewhat out because we are very mission driven. Uh, I mean, we do need to build a sustainable business, but there are a couple different uh, ways that we are doing that right now. And I do think we will probably settle on one, but because we are an early stage company, uh, there's sure. still a, there's some optionality in there. Um, but it's actually not as as much rocket science uh, or like a, as much of like a... Uh, it's a pretty straightforward, it's a pretty straightforward game. Um, mm-hmm. Open source software has existed for a very long time. Um, and uh, at its core, you know, most decentralized platforms like Quill, they are open source, source software that can be run by anybody else as well. Um, but there is still a lot of tooling that needs to be provided around that open source software. Um, you know, when companies, you know, going back to that original example from the start of the episode, uh, it, when a company, they want to build an identity platform, uh, they don't want to be the only ones actually running that. They want, you know, five companies or 10 companies to be running that. They need the actual properly distributed infrastructure to begin nurturing that ecosystem. Uh, mm-hmm. That is also really where we can help. And that's actually really in line with a lot of other uh, like database company business models like Mongo, like Oracle. Um, I, Oracle does a lot now, but I, I would say looking to this for like the original Mongo business model, it's sure. actually pretty in line with that. Uh, there are some other pretty interesting ways that people are monetizing permissionless applications, and these are mostly through tokens. Um, now, I think for the time being, we have sort of decided that that is not something that it would be beneficial to our users. And so we have not pursued that yet. Um, but that is another way that uh, these open source permissionless applications have been able to, I mean, not only just accrue value and you know build a sustainable business, but also it actually helps them bootstrap that self-sustaining ecosystem. Uh, but that's something that we can go into if you'd like. But, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of podcasts on those. Yeah, no, I think that this for our audience, I think this is a great introduction to what you're doing with this whole world 
of you know this kind of service offering, I think, is is something that is a little bit out there for a lot of people. I mean, you don't you don't often think about this unless you're in that space. So you're like super deep in this space. Um, but I think for a lot of us, especially those of us at large organizations or what have you, um, this is great background knowledge, and it's certainly going to be useful for folks as they're looking at how do we complement the existing technologies that we're working with and start to evolve towards this Web 3.0 and and some of these other um, factors that we should be considering in our in our own businesses or at least interacting and integrating with uh, as appropriate. So Brennan, we're about out of time. Uh, last things for, and we've covered a lot of ground today. It's been really cool um, learning about this stuff because I certainly don't know uh, much about this at all. If people want to follow up after the show and learn more, what's the best way to contact you or reach out and, and learn more about Quill? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the best way to uh, you know reach Quill would probably just be on our website, quill.com, K-W-I-L.com. Um, but then also, uh, I mean, from that website, you can get uh, the contact info for our company, which, I mean, that goes to uh, my co-founder who sits in the desk right next to me. So <laughs> uh, we'll definitely see your message. Um, and so that is probably the best way is other email. Um, we also do have a Discord where a lot of people will reach out to us on there. Um, we, have, we have a Twitter. It's uh, we have this Quill team, uh, KWIL team on Twitter. Um, any of those, we should be able to get back to you pretty quickly. Um, yeah. Outstanding. Brennan, thank you so much for being on the show today. Really appreciate it. Yep. It's really been a pleasure. Thank you. And this podcast is data leadership for everyone. But if you need some data leadership for you, I want to help. So send your questions to podcast at dl4e1.com or my phone number is 773-888-2077 if you'd prefer to text or leave a voicemail. You can find subscription links in all our episodes at dataleadershipforeveryone.com. And until next time, be good to your data, be better to your business and be best to each other. Now go make an impact.